Math 110, Intermediate Algebra, we have a final exam review. It can be a bit intimidating. It is 90 problems long. And more than that, it covers all of Unit A to K. But that's okay. I'm going to help you get through it. We're going to walk through this together starting now. Starting with solving and graphing this inequality, we're going to go ahead and first try to get all the x's on the same side. So right now we've got some x's on the left and some x's on the right, so I'm going to subtract 8x from both sides. And that gives me negative 6x. I'm also going to add 7 to both sides. And now over here I have 12. Now, all I did was I added and subtracted, so that's not going to do anything to my sign. However, this next step will. I'm about to divide by a negative 6. And whenever you multiply or divide by a negative, and you're dealing with inequalities, not only does it switch the sign of the thing you're dividing by, but also it flips the inequality sign. So this ends up being x is less than negative 2. And if we were to graph that result, we just want a number line with our key point being negative 2, and then we want all the numbers less than that. So there's two ways you can write it. You can write it with an open circle in less than that, like that, because that's the direction of less than, the left, or you can sometimes see it with a parentheses right at the negative 2. So I'm going to graph this result. So first step, it's going to have to be to get rid of these parentheses by doing the distributive property. And so that's 8 x plus 16 is greater than 2x plus 6. Get the x's on the same side. So I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides, and I get 6x. I'm also going to subtract the 16 from both sides, and so I'm going to get 6x is greater than negative 10. Now, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and divide by that 6 to get the x by itself. And so x, and I divide by 6 on both sides. Now, I'm not going to flip this inequality sign because, because in this case, I wasn't multiplying or dividing by a negative, but rather I ended up with a negative. And that's, that's a different story altogether. So that is my solution. Now comes the point where we graph it. Now, obviously, if I could just make a point on here, I would say, well, I'm going to just make the point negative 5 over 3. So, but let's, let's pretend we don't have that. Let's pretend we can go and say there's a couple different numbers we're dealing with. We're dealing with negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And so we should recognize that negative 5 over 3 is 5 thirds. So that's in this range. Okay. Now, it's greater than. So rather than being that way, I'm going to put an open circle there and go this way because it says x is greater than. Graph the following inequality. It's already solved for me, so I'm just going to go ahead and go ahead and graph it. So I'm going to say at the number 4, I'm going to do an open circle because I don't have an equal sign, and it says greater than, so I'm going to go that way. Okay. Now, as an inequality, or in interval notation, I'm going to write 4, comma, infinity. Absolute value equations look scarier than they are. Now, we understand already that absolute value means that what's inside is going to be positive no matter what. So really what we're saying is this isn't necessarily a 6. What's inside there could also be a negative 6. So to solve absolute value equations, what we do is we set up two equations. First one, we leave it exactly the way it is. 1 half x minus 8 equals 6. And we go ahead and solve it, and we get plus 8 plus 8. 1 half x equals 14. Then we'll multiply both sides by 2, and I get x equals 28. But there's one other possibility. Since no matter what I put in there, whether it's positive or negative, it's going to end up being a positive. So I have another possibility for what 1 half x minus 8 could equal. It might equal 6, or the other option, it could equal negative 6. Now we solve that equation in the same way. We add 8, and that gives me 2. We have 1 half x 
equals 2, multiplied both sides by 2, and I get x equals 4. Now, one mistake people do is they try to just solve it the first way and then put plus or minus, okay? But that is actually not true. Notice that this was a completely different number, and they both ended up being positive numbers. But those are our two answers. So here's an absolute value equation. But before we split it into two equations, what we're going to do is we have to get the absolute value by itself. So I'm going to start by subtracting 6. And that gives me negative 9 equals negative 3 absolute value x minus 1. Now, the absolute value is not quite by itself because we have a negative 3 beside it. So I'm going to divide by negative 3 on both sides. And when I do that, I get x minus 1 equals 3, positive 3. So x minus 1 equals positive 3. And since it's absolute value, that's going to be two equations. First, it could be x minus 1 equals 3. And then I could solve it, and I get x equals 4. Or what could happen is it could be x minus 1 equals negative 3. And if I add 1 to both sides, I get x equals negative 2. So I end up with both of those as solutions. So I'm going to graphing this absolute value inequality. Now, the good news is the absolute value is already by itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to write it as two separate inequalities. The first one's going to be negative 3x plus 7. It's greater than 8. Notice all I did was I erased the absolute value signs. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write the same thing negative 3x plus 7, except I'm going to put negative 8. I'm also going to flip my inequality. So because I changed the sign on the right, I'm going to flip my inequality. Now I'm going to go ahead and solve each of these, minus 7, minus 7. I'm going to do both of them at the same time to be really fancy. That gives me negative 3x less than negative 15. And this one gives me negative 3x is greater than 1. And so I'm going to divide both sides by negative 3. And again, I'm going to do both of them at the same time because that feels fancy. Notice that when I divide it by a negative, I have to flip this sign. So that's going to happen here. And I end up with those two inequalities. So in order to graph that, I'm going to graph each of them separately and then put the graphs together. So the first graph is going to be x is less than negative one-third. So I'm going to go to negative one-third, and it's less than that. That means I'm going to go to negative one-third, but I'm going to go left of that. This one says x is greater than 5, so I'm going to go to 5, and it's going to be greater than 5. Okay, so these are actually going in the opposite directions. So if I were going to graph them combined, what would I end up doing? Well, because it's an absolute value, and because I've got two of them, what this has is both of them on the same one. So I'm going to say negative one-third going this way, and five going this way. Now, how do we write that in interval notation? It was easy enough to write it in just inequality notation because that's what we solved it as. But in interval notation, that means we're going to write from negative infinity to positive infinity. Although, it doesn't go all the way from negative infinity to positive infinity. It goes from negative infinity to negative one-third. And then it pauses and it picks up over here at 5 to positive infinity. And in between those, since this is an or, we're going to put a u. And that's the way we're going to write that in interval notation. Here's an absolute value. And this one is a less than. I want to give you a little heads up here. When we have an absolute value and it's less than, I want you to think about it as less than. Okay? So here's what that's going to look like. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to write it twice. 2x plus 8 less than or equal to 10, and 2x plus 8 is greater than or equal to negative 10. We change the sign, and we flip it. The next thing we're going to do is subtract 8 from both sides, 
and that gives me 2x is less than or equal to 2. 2x is greater than or equal to negative 18. I'm going to divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2, divide by 2, and I get x is less than or equal to 1, and x is greater than or equal to negative 9. So I have my two graphs, but this is an less than, this is an and. So unlike an or, where they might go apart from each other, this is actually stuck in between. This is saying that I have all the x's that are greater than negative 9 and less than 1. And so as a graph, that's going to look like greater than negative 9 and less than 1. Now I'm going to use a square bracket to show that I'm including that, but we could also use filled in circles. Last thing we have to do is write it in interval notation. And that's not too bad because we're going to use square bracket, negative 9, comma, 1, square bracket. Graphing the linear equation by plotting its intercepts. So the first thing we need to recognize is that the y-intercept is when the x is 0, what is the y value, and the x-intercept is when the y is 0, what is the x value? And so we can do that just really quickly by plugging in a zero. And what we get is 2y equals 4. So y equals 2. So just like that, we have a y-intercept. We can plot, plug in zero the other way, and we get negative x equals 4. So negative 4. And then plotting those would just allow us to put these on our x and y axis. And you can make a line just by connecting the dots. Find the x and y intercept of this equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in to find the x intercept. We're going to plug in 0 for the y. And to find the y intercept, we're going to plug in 0 for the x. And when I do that, I get 6x equals 30 or x equals 5. Or I get negative 5y equals 30, or y equals negative 6. Graph this equation by plotting points. Now, I could make a big table, okay? I could do that. But what I want to show instead is I want to solve this for y, because I want to show you what I'm seeing. If I solve this for y, by getting the y by itself, I get 28 equals 4y. I just added 4y to both sides. Divide by 4 and I get 7 equals y. So if I were to make a table and plot a bunch of points, I don't need to plot a bunch. I only need to plot a couple. I need an x and a y. So I, I know my y. My y is 7. My y is 7 when I plug in what for x? Well, actually, my y is always 7. This is a constant function because the y is always 7. In fact, there's nothing, no place to plug in the x. I could plug in a 1, but there'd be no place to put it. Okay, so this is going to be that horizontal line at y equals 7. Graph the following function. This function is kind of funny to look at because it's not a y equals, it's an x equals. So this is actually going to be a function where every point on that line is at x equals 6. Okay, so all of my points on my line have the same x value. This is a vertical line at x equals 6. All vertical lines are going to be x equals, and all horizontal lines are going to be y equals. Find the slope. Now, the slope is the change of y over change of x. In other words, we're going to say delta y over delta x is our slope. And so we're just going to say, how much did the y change from negative 10 to 9? It went up 19, OK? So the change was up 19. And from 2 to negative 3, how much did the x change? It went down 5. We're going to simplify that a little bit. I'm just going to put negative 19 over 5 because it doesn't simplify much. And that's my slope. Find the slope of the line if it exists. Now, does the slope of the line exist? Well, first off, how steep would you say that line is? If you tried to ski uh, down that slope, would it be a 0, as in very, very easy? Or would it be a 10, as in really, really steep? Or, in this case, it would be an infinity. This slope does not exist. Okay, I'm going to put D and E, stands for does not exist. The reason is because this is a vertical line. So we have x equals 5. 
find the slope of the line if it exists okay so imagine you're going skiing and i said look at this hill we're going to ski down it's very difficult and then i'm going to say it's a 10 on 10 out of difficulty and you'd say no it's not this isn't very steep at all the slope of this one is zero because this is just a flat line at y equals two Find the slope in the y-intercept. I can do that by putting it in y equals mx plus b. So I'm going to do that by subtracting 4x from both sides. And I get y equals negative 4x minus b well, minus 8. And the y-intercept tells me there's my slope. And right there is my intercept. Use the slope intercept form to graph the equation. Now, we've got in slope intercept form already. We have two things. We've got the y intercept. So I could go on my y axis and go to 1 and go ahead and put a point right there. That's where it crossed the y axis. I know that. But I'm also going to move according to my slope. My slope says go down, down 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And it says go over 3, 1, 2, 3. So I've got a second point right there. Notice that I moved according to my slope from my y-axis. So I moved down 4. I didn't start at the middle. I actually started at my y-intercept. Use the slope-intercept form to graph the equation. It's not in slope-intercept form, so the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 2x from both sides. And I get y equals negative 2x plus 1. My slope is negative 2. My y-intercept is 1, so I'm going to start by graphing my y-intercept. I'm going to go to 1, and then I'm going to move according to my slope. It says go down 2, 1, 2. And then I can't just put a point there. I need to move over. So if we don't have a denominator that tells us rise over run, we just move over 1. So I'm going to put my second point right there, and then I'm going to connect my dots. Write the equation of the line, which is a slope of 6 and passes through 4, 2. Okay, so there is a, an equation for this, but I have a hard time memorizing a bunch of formulas. So I'm just going to use y equals mx plus b. And I don't know b because that is not b. That's actually x and y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the three numbers I have for three of the letters. So the y is 2, the slope is 6, and the x is 4. I don't know the B, so I'm going to leave the B as a B. So now my goal is to solve this equation to figure out what is the B. So I'm going to multiply 6 and 4, and I get 24, and I'm subtracted from both sides, and I get negative 22 equals B. Now I know that no B. I also know my slope. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite it as Y equals 6X minus 22. Right, the equation passes through these two points. It just gives me two points. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find my slope. My slope is my change in y over my change in x. So how much do the, does the y increase? The y goes up 1. And how much does my x increase? It goes up 2. So I'm going to simplify that just a little bit and say my slope is 1 half. Now I know my slope and I know a couple points, but what I don't know is my y-intercept. So I'm going to use my y equals mx plus b formula, which is my slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b, and I'm going to plug in three things. I don't know the b, so I'm going to plug in b for b, but everything else, I'm going to use one of my two points. I could have used 3, 4, but I'm going to use 1, 3. Why not? So the y I'm going to use is the 3. The slope I have is 1 half, and the x I have is 1. Okay, now I'm just going to solve that to find B. And so if I multiply 1 half by 1 and then I subtract from both sides, I get 2.5 equals B. Okay, now I'm going to rewrite my equation as Y equals 1 half X plus 2.5. Not 2 fifths. I got to watch myself here. 2.5. Find the slope of a line parallel and perpendicular. So there's two actual answers to this one. First off, this line, if I wanted to say the same line again, I'd just write the same thing. I'd write y equals 1 ninth x. It has the same slope, and the slate intercept might be minus 4. But instead, I'm just going to write minus 7. So it's got the same slope. That means parallel. 
Next thing I'm going to do is do one that's perpendicular. So I do y equals, and instead of doing the same slope, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the slope upside down. So I'm going to make it 9 over 1 and make it negative. Now I'm going to simplify that a little bit because 9 over 1 is just 9. So we have negative 9x. So I've changed my slope, and I just need to make sure I don't accidentally pick the same line, okay? So I'm going to make sure I don't accidentally pick the same line. So I'm going to put, what's the number that's definitely not 4? How about 100, okay? And so that would be a perpendicular line. Determine whether these three ordered pairs are solutions to this equation. Well, this system of equations. So it needs to work for both of them. So I'm going to start at the top, and I'm just going to see which ones work for equation 1. 2, 8. If I do 2 minus 8, I don't get. That doesn't work in my first equation because it's supposed to equal negative 4, and it gets negative 6. Okay, so that one's out. I don't even need to check it in the second equation. The second one, I'm going to plug in negative 2, negative 2. If I plug in negative 2 minus 2, it equals negative 4. It says it's supposed to equal negative 4. So guess what? It works in the first equation. So the next question I have is, does negative 2, negative 2 work in the second equation? So I'm going to plug in negative 2 for x and positive 2 for y. And let's see what we get. We get negative 2, which is the same. So this one actually works for both of them. Great. What if we flip it around and we do the same thing, except let's go back and we're going to check in the first one, 2 minus 2. Does that equal negative 4. 2 minus negative 2 equals positive 4. So that doesn't work in our first equation. So the only one that works is B. Solve the system of equations by graphing. I love graphing as my solving. Now I might do a couple things to graph this, but I'm really just going to graph it in a graphing calculator. But let's say I don't have a fancy graphing calculator and I just have a handheld graphing calculator. Okay, or let's say I wanted to graph it by hand. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to want to solve it for y. So I'm going to solve each of them for y. The first one, if I add y to both sides, I get y equals x plus 6. And that's done. The next one, if I get y by itself, I get y equals negative x plus 2. Okay, so those two don't have the same slope. They have different slopes, so they definitely intersect. And so if we're going to solve it by graphing, what we do is we go ahead and graph each of them. And then we find the point of intersection. So I'm going to go up 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then have a slope of 1. The second one says we go up 2, and we have a negative slope of 1. And so we intersect here. Now, if I was doing this on graph paper or using graph calculator, i get the right answer. But since I don't have a graphing calculator, one thing we can do is we can just set these two equal each other. They both equal the same y. So we just need to figure out what the x would be that would match. So that would be x plus 6 equals negative x plus 2. I'm going to add x to both sides. And now it's 2x subtract 6 equals negative 4. So x equals negative 2. That's only one part of my solution because that's my x coordinate. But the question becomes, what is my y coordinate? If I plug in negative 2, if I plug in negative 2, what would the y have to be? Now, I can go back into either one of my equations, and what you're going to see is that the y, if I plug in negative 2, has to be positive 4. So my solution is the point of intersection, negative 2, comma, 4. So I solved it by graphing, but then I really solved it by substitution. Solve the systems of, any systems of equations by the substitution method. Now, in order to solve them by the substitution method, they need to be equal to the same thing. Right now, they're not. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set them both equal to uh, the same value. Or I can set one of them equal to, and I can back substitute it in. I think it's a little bit easier if you can get them equal to the same thing at the same time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get them both so they equal 2y. I want to make sure I have a 2y by itself. So in order to do that on the top one, I add 2y to both sides, and I get 3x, and I subtract 10, minus 10 equals 2y. The second equation already has a 2y in it, and I'm just going to subtract the x, and so I get 2y equals 6 minus x. 
Now, if 2y is this one and 2y is this one, then I can substitute those out to get 3x minus 10 equals 6 minus x. I'm going to solve that for x by adding x to both sides, and I get 4x, and I add 10 to both sides equals 16, so x equals 4. Now, before you say, yay, we win, we need to go back in and plug it in to find out what the y would be. And in this case, if we plug it in and we plug 4 in for x, we get the y has to be 1 for it to work, which means our ordered pair is 4, 1. Solve the system of equations by the elimination method. Now, the elimination method is where we try to get the two of two equations to crunch together to cancel out or eliminate one of our variables. We do that by trying to get them to be equal but opposite. So I want you to notice that the bottom equation has a 3x in it and the top equation has a 9x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this, I'm going to multiply the whole equation by negative 3. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because if I do that, then I would get negative 9x minus 24y equals negative a whole bunch. Negative 3 times 24 is negative 72. All right, so I multiplied it by 3, and I can do that because algebra says I can do that as long as I do the same thing to both sides. And what I found was now if I look at the two equations and I put them right on top of each other, you'll notice that we have a 9x and a negative 9x. And the elimination method is to go ahead and crunch those together and add the two lines together. And that would cancel out. And I would end up with negative 19y equals negative 57. And so y would equal 3. And so yay, I've got 3. Now what do I do with that 3? I'm going to take that and I'm going to plug that back into my equation. And it turns out x needs to be 0. So my ordered pair is 0, 3. Jen Butler has been pricing speed pass train fares for a group trip to New York. The three adults and four children must pay $80. So three adults plus four children must pay $80. If they only take a second group, and the second group only has two adults and three children, they save some money because there's less people. It's $57. Our goal is to find the price of the ticket. Okay, so there's a different price for the adults and for the child ticket. So what we're going to do is set up our system of equations. Notice I just kind of read it as I went and wrote down just like that. If you felt more comfortable going X's and Y's, the one thing I'm going to tell you to do is if you're going to set up a system of equations with X's and Y's, please, 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 somewhere, just make a note. The X was the adult ticket price. And the Y was the child price. So definitely make a note somewhere of what your variables are representing. Because you don't want to get the right answers and then put them in as in backwards. All right, so we can solve this any number of ways. The way that jumps out at me is usually elimination. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get them so that they're equal and opposite. In order to do that, I'm going to multiply the top equation by negative 2. No, I'm going to multiply it by positive 2, and I'll multiply the bottom equation by negative 3. Okay? The reason is because I want to cancel something out. And I know that if I can turn this 3 and the 2 into a negative 6, a least common multiple might be 6. So I want to cancel out my x's. If I do that, I'm going to rewrite my equation as 6x plus 8y equals 160. I just multiplied the first line by 2. The second line would end up being negative 6x minus 9y equals, and negative 3 times 57 is a lot. It's negative 171. All right, from this point, you can look at it and you say, well, now that we have these together, we can cancel them out. These cancel out. But these, when we add them together, 8y minus 9y is negative 1y. These, when we add them together, is negative 11. So guess what? y equals 11. And so just like that, we have the y value. All we have to do is then plug it in to find the adult value. So I'm going to do that by plugging it into the one on the top. And if I plug in 11 for my y, I would end up with... 
44. And if I subtract that, I end up with, not too bad, I end up with a 3x equals 80 minus 44 is 36. So x equals 12. And so I have my two values. So back in context, I need to say, what is 12 and 11 represent? Well, 12 is the adult price of a ticket, and 11 is the child price of a ticket. At a concession stand, three hot dogs, three hot dogs, and four hamburgers cost $9. Now, I have another equation. It says four hot dogs and three hamburgers cost eight fifty. Find the cost of one hot dog and the cost of one hamburger. Now, I used H and B, and I think that's clear. But then again, hot dog and hamburger both start with H. So you might want to use X's and Y's. And the problem with switching to X's and Y's, they're usually pretty comfortable to work with is you need to make a note somewhere of what the X represents. The X represents the hamburger price. No, what did the X represent? Make sure you pay attention. Three hot dogs, all right, three hot dogs, so that's the hot dog price. And the Y represents the hamburger price. Now, in order to solve this, there's a number of things we can do, okay? So, elimination is very tempting at this one because I could multiply the top one by four and the bottom by negative three. And we can do that. But, rather than do that, let's try to mix it up, okay? Um, let's try to solve it for X. Okay, so I'm gonna solve this one with substitution. I usually like to do elimination, but we'll do substitution on this one. So if I try to solve that first equation and get the X by itself, what that means I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to subtract the 4Y and then divide by three. That would give me X equals, kind of an ugly problem because I get negative four, three, Y equals, oh, sorry, <laughs> plus three. Nine divided by three is three. All right, so we have one equation, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that x equation and plug it back in for that x equation. And if I do that, what I end up with is I end up with a brand new equation with no x's in it at all. Four, times negative four over three y plus three plus three y. So I'm gonna have to do a little bit of math because I'm gonna need to get that all by itself. And so I'm gonna first distribute my four. It's worth noting that that's still equal to 850. Uh, I'm gonna first distribute my four and that would end up with negative 16 over 3y plus 12 plus 3y equals 850. All right, I don't like that I have a three right there. It makes my problem a little bit uglier because I've got this decimal. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply the whole thing by three. And if I multiply this whole equation by three, what happens is I don't have any more fractions because the first part becomes negative 16y and then it becomes plus 36 plus 9y equals 8.5 times 3 is 17, uh, 25.5. Okay. All this to go ahead and say I'd end up with negative 5y plus 36 equals 25.5. Combine those terms. Subtract 36 from both sides. And, I, and then divide by negative 5. And I end up with y equals 
to 10. All right, that is a hideous, hideous problem. Um, at least it was when I solved it that way, okay? When we pick the right method, we are going to make ourselves a little bit easier. If we picked elimination, it would have worked a little bit nicer. So now all we need to do is we need to plug that back in. So we have a Y value. I'm going to clean this up. I hope that's okay. But I'm going to try to give myself some room to work. Going back to my original equation. Now that I have my Y value, I'm just going to plug it in for Y and see what I end up with. So I'm gonna plug it in my second one. And so I get 4x plus three times $2.10 equals 8.50. So what I'm saying is the three hot dogs, or the three hamburgers would cost me three times 2.10. So that would cost me $6.30 of my 850 cents. So how much is left over? Well, I'm going to subtract the 630 from both sides. And what would I end up with is 4x equals 220. Okay, divide that by 4. And so x equals 55, 0.55. And so what we said is this is a very cheap concession stand. It only costs 55 cents for a hot dog. And... $2.10 for a hamburger. Um, does that make sense for our problem? I think probably, <laughs> okay? And we can play with it some more if you wanted to plug in both the numbers to double check. I'm gonna stick with it. We have two polynomials and we have to add them. That means we're just going to line them up and add the like terms. So like terms there is I'm going to get negative 1b squared. Then we have like term there and there is going to cancel out. And like term there and there is going to be a positive 1. Subtracting polynomials. I don't like to subtract polynomials. I distribute the negative and then I add them. Okay. So when I do that, I'm going to also rewrite it underneath. So the first one I have is 3x cubed. Notice that there's no x squared term. Minus 8x, so I left some space for this x squared, plus 6. Underneath, I'm going to write, after I distribute the negative, I had positive 8x squared, and then I had negative 5x, and then the negative 9 becomes positive 9. I lined them up, so that, that'll make my combining a little bit easier. Now that I distributed the negative, I don't need to subtract. I'm just going to add the lines up. And I get positive 15. I get negative 13x. And then I get positive 8x squared. And then I get 3x to the third. Multiplying two monomials isn't too bad because we're going to multiply each piece separately. In other words, I'm going to multiply the 3 times the 7 to give me 21. I'm going to multiply the w's together, so I have a w with an exponent of 1 and an exponent of 3, so that's a total w's of 4. And then we have z's, and so there's 2 and 5, so a total of z to the 7th. So this is my combination. Now, if I have an exponent outside of parentheses, I can go ahead and bring that inside, but I'm going to make sure I apply it to each piece. So first we have 2 to the 3rd. And then each of the variables with exponents, we're going to multiply those exponents together. So a to the second is going to become a to the sixth, b to the third becomes b to the ninth, and c becomes c cubed. One last thing I want to do is I want to simplify that. 2 to the third is 2 times 2 times 2, or 8. So I end up with 8, a to the sixth, b to the nine, and c to the third. We have an exponent outside, and even though there's a fraction, I want you to recognize that we can go ahead and bring that exponent in, but we need to bring it in in both the top and bottom. So when we do that, we get 4 to the third on the top, and on the bottom we get y to the 3 times 3, or 9. One last thing we can do to simplify this a little bit is that 4 times 4 times 4 is 64, so we're going to leave it as 64 over y 
to the ninth. We're going to multiply these two polynomials together. Now, it's not just one thing we have to distribute because this is a binomial multiplied by a trinomial. So two terms multiplied by three terms. So I'm going to distribute the first thing to all three things in the second uh, set of parentheses. So I'm going to do that with the x first. And that would give me x cubed minus 7x squared plus 2x. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the negative 3 by the three things in the second set of parentheses. I'm going to kind of line these up, okay? So that's why I'm going to write them the way I write them, but I'm going to line them up so that I can combine like terms in a second. So that would give me negative 3x squared plus 21x minus 6. And now we're going to combine like terms to get our final answer, x to the third minus 10x squared plus 23x minus 6. Now, the number one mistake I see when people see this problem is they want to just go ahead and distribute that exponent n, although that will give them the wrong answer. The truth is that they need to treat this as if it is two things multiplied together. In other words, the same thing multiplied by itself two times. So when I write it like this, you'll see that we, what we really have to do is we have to distribute that out or FOIL it. And so what we're going to end up with is 25a squared. And then after we end up combining the like terms in the middle, we're going to end up with negative 60ab. And then finally, we're going to get positive 36b squared. Dividing monomials. Now, notice that these are monomials. In other words, there's just one cluster at the top and one cluster at the bottom. We're going to treat each type of uh, the problem separately. So I'm going to look at just this part right here, just the numbers, and simplify that. Well, that's not too bad because negative 64 divided by negative 4 is just 16. Now, if I look at the f's, I have an f on the bottom, and I have just one, and then I have f cubed on the top. So I'm going to actually end up subtracting those and just get f squared on the top. In the same way, the last part is 12 minus 4. So I end up with g to the eighth on top. And I don't even have a fraction anymore. There's no denominator because everything on top canceled out with things on the bottom. What we have here is we have a negative exponent. We also have a set of parentheses. So either way we want to do it, I'm going to deal, deal with the negative first. So the first thing I'm going to do is deal with that negative by saying a negative exponent flips the fraction upside down. And you might say, but there's not a fraction there. Well, there is a fraction there. It's just over 1. So if I wanted to get rid of the negative exponent, I would have to flip what's inside that parentheses upside down. And that is... a effectively what the negative exponent has done. The next thing we need to do is we still need to bring in that that fourth exponent. One to the fourth is just one, so that's not too bad. And then on the bottom, we just need to multiply those out. So I'm going to say x to the 28th and y to the 16th. divide. Although notice that this actually has three separate things on the top. I can't just cancel out in one section. I need to treat each of them. So the question I really have is, what can I take out of all three of them? Okay. So can I take a, a four out of all three of those? And the answer is yes. I would end up with four c to the third minus three c to the 6th plus 3c to the 8th. Okay, that's if I just did the 4. Now, the other thing I'll, I'll try to do is try to take out the c's. Can I take 3 c's out of each of them, a c to the 3rd? Yeah, I can. In fact, this one's going to work out pretty nice because I end up with 4 minus 3c to the 3rd plus 3c to the 5th.
divide. Divide a trinomial by a monomial. Now, this we need to think about how we can take everything we can out of all three of them. So, the first thing I'm going to do is try to factor the numerator, if at all possible. Okay, so I'm going to factor the numerator. Is there anything I can take out of all three of those? Well, I can't take out a five from all three or a four or a two. So actually the answer is I can't take any of the numbers out of all three of them, but all three of them on top have an N with an exponent. So I can actually take an N to the fifth power out of all three of them. That would leave me with five minus 12 N squared plus four N just like that. So at this point, if I look at the bottom and I go, you know what? Now I have an n to the fifth on the top and the bottom. And so when we simplify fractions, what we're really trying to do is cancel out something, a factor on the top and the bottom. And so my final answer for this is just gonna be five minus 12 n squared plus four n all over 48. Pay attention though to when you're answering questions like this, if they want you to split this up into three separate pieces, then you could do that as well. Factor by grouping, check the answer, okay? So the first thing I want you to notice is that this has four terms. So the first thing I wanna do is just assume that they're in a nice group order for me. If I group the first two and say, what can I take out of both of these? What goes into a 4a also goes into 15bc? And the answer is, uh, a one that like literally only a one would factor out of that. And if I look at the second one, we'll see the same problem, only a one. So nothing really special seemed to be happening. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna reorder these a little bit and see if that unlocks the key to this problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna switch these two around. We could switch a different pair and try it and see if it works. I'm just switching those two at random. Well, not at random. The reason I switched those two is because I kind of like that the, it would put the ones that only have one variable together and the ones that have two variables together. So now what you'll notice is if I try to factor out of the first two, there is something I can take out. It's not much, but it's a four, and that would leave me with an A plus three B. And if I look at the second set, and I say, what can I take out of both of those? And the answer is I can take out, not much, but I can take out a 5C, a positive 5C, and that would leave me with 3B plus A. Okay, so that seemed to help me, but we don't quite have the same thing in both of them. So I do want you to notice that what's inside the parentheses is very, very similar. In fact, it's just the same thing in a different order. Since addition's commutative, we can say, yeah, that's actually the same thing. 3A plus, 3A plus 3B is the same as 3B plus A. So we can actually write our answer as two answers that A plus 3B, and then the other parentheses, we're just gonna put the other thing. In other words, what do we have left on the outside? Factor. So factoring this trinomial at first looks very intimidating because we've got some pretty ugly numbers, but more than that is that we've got numbers in front of our lead coefficient or our lead variable. So what that means we need to do before we try to find two numbers that work is we need to multiply the first coefficient and the last coefficient together. So 14 times 25. So what we're gonna try to do is find two numbers that multiply to whatever 14 times 25 equals, but also it has to add to the number in the middle, which is negative 39, okay? So we could run through all the options and try to guess and check, okay? But I actually noticed something special about this one. That what I noticed is that negative 39, if they add to give me a negative, but they multiply to give me a positive, then that means that they both have to be negative because the negatives would cancel out when they multiply. And what do you, you notice? Well, we have negative 14 and negative 25 do actually 
add up to negative 39. So that saves me a little bit of work trying to find two special numbers. So the next thing I do is I like to use the split the middle term method for factoring. I take the middle term and I keep the other parts the same, but I split it. So rather than writing negative 39, I use my two special numbers, in this case, negative 14. And I put the variable with it, negative 14y, and then negative 25y. And so I know that I still have negative 39y. I've just split it into two pieces. And I pull down what I have at the beginning, 14y squared. And I pull down what I have at the end, which is 25. And from here, I have four things. And I'm going to go ahead and factor by grouping. And you'll notice that factoring by grouping looks pretty straightforward here. 14 y and that would leave me y minus 1 and then i have take out a negative 25 and i get well y minus 1 again and so my two factors would be y minus 1 and 14 y minus 25. factor completely this is a binomial there's only two terms so the first thing I'm going to look for is a greatest common factor. Is there anything I can take out of both of them? In this case, only a one would do that. So that's not going to help me. So the next thing I'm going to do is say, is it a special binomial? There are two special binomials. So there's the sum of cubes or difference of cubes. And then there's this sum of or, or this difference of squares. I almost said sum of squares because sum of squares actually doesn't factor. But since this is a minus right here and both of these can be square rooted they're both perfect squares then i can jump straight to my answer this is a special pattern and so it's the square root of the first one minus the square root of the second one and then we do the same thing except this time what we do is we put a plus in the middle and the reason this works is because if we were to try to multiply this back out the middle parts would end up canceling out we get positive 7x and negative 7x and that's why when we're done we get just two things instead of having a normal trinomial. This is a binomial and it actually straight up tells us, it says use the sum of cubes formula. So first off, that means we're gonna need to figure out what the perfect cubes are in this problem. So I'm gonna cube root the first thing and cube root the second thing. So what's the cube root of x cubed? It's just x. What's the cube root of 125 is just five. And our formula is pretty much this. We take that and we keep the sign the same. And then we're gonna make another set of parentheses. And the first thing we do is we take our first thing and we square it. So x squared is gonna be just x squared. And then we multiply our two pieces together. So five times x is five x. And then the last thing we need is we square the last number. So we square the five and we get 25. Okay, we need to watch our signs. The way I remember it is the same, the opposite, and the last one is always positive. So since this was a sum of cubes, I can have a plus in the beginning, the same, and then I'm gonna put the opposite sign as my second one, and my last one is always positive. If this was a difference of cubes, I'd just switch those out. I'd use the same, opposite, and always positive. Solve by factoring. This is a quadratic equation. So the first thing I'm going to do is if I'm going to solve it by factoring is get it equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract and get things all over on the left. So it's equal to zero. So I have r squared plus 2r minus 35 equals zero. Now we're just going to factor by finding two numbers that multiply to negative 35. And so one of them is negative and they need to add to a positive two. So the bigger number will be positive. So I think this one's not too bad because we have R plus seven and R minus five. Last thing is we'll remember that our solutions are actually the opposites of our factors. So our two answers are negative seven and positive five. Solve by factoring. This is a quadratic there's a an exponent but the first thing i need to do if i'm going to solve by factoring is get it all equal to zero so i'm going to subtract 5x from both sides and i get 3x squared minus 3x equals zero now this is kind of funny because this is just a binomial not a trinomial so my first tactic my strategy is going to be to 
take out the greatest common factor. So I can actually take a 3x out of both terms, and that would leave me an x minus 1. Now I have two factors equal to 0, so I'm going to set them each equal to 0. 3x equals 0. Well, that would give me x equals 0. And then I have x minus 1 equals 0. And so if I add 1 to both sides, I get x equals 1. So those are my two solutions. Simplify. We have a rational expression here. In other words, we have a fraction in algebra. So we have variables on the top and bottom. So the first thing we're going to try to do is actually to factor the numerator and the denominator. So I'm going to factor the denominator and the numerator. The first thing I'm going to do is factor the denominator because that one looks simpler because I don't have a number in front of the x squared. I just have a 1. Okay, so I need two numbers that multiply to negative 6 and add to positive 1. So this isn't too bad. So I'm going to say plus 3 and x minus 2. And that would meet my criteria. So that's that's pretty quick. But in order to simplify the second, the one on the top, I want to first say, can I take anything out of everything? The answer is no. So then I'm going to say, I'm going to multiply a times c. I need two things that multiply to negative 12. They multiply to negative 12. And they add to my middle term of negative 4. So two numbers that multiply to negative 12 and add to negative 4. If you don't know off the top of your head, you can start working through. And you can say, well, I know that it has to be the bigger one has to be negative because it adds to negative. So I could say 1 and negative 12, but that doesn't add to negative 4. You can say 2 and negative 6, and actually that's it, 2 and negative 6. So what we're going to do is we're instead of just jumping right to our answer like we could do in the denominator, is we're going to split our middle term. So I write the first term just like it was, and I write the last term just like it was. But the middle term, the negative 4x, I write as plus 2x minus 6x. From here, we're going to factor with grouping, so I'm just going to look at the first two terms, and what can I take out of both of them? I can take an x out, and that would leave me with 3x plus 2. What can I take out of the second two? I can take a negative 2 out, and that would leave, leave me with, well, 3x plus 2. My final answer is going to be these two factors, okay? So 3x plus 2 times x minus 2. Now before you get excited and think, oh, we're done, remember that what we started with was a fraction. So I'm going to rewrite this problem that we started with just in factored form. So the top of the fraction is that 3x plus 2 and x minus 2, and the bottom of the fraction is going to be that x plus 3 and x minus 2. But when we have fractions and we're trying to simplify, which is what the question tells us to do, we can cancel out things that are the same on the top and bottom. We have an x minus 2 on the top and bottom, which means our final answer is just 3x plus 2 over x plus 3. Multiply and simplify. So we can do this a couple different ways. We could crunch them all together, and then we could factor, and then we could cancel out, or we could factor, and then cancel out, and then crunch them together. I would rather factor first. And the reason is because if we crunch them together, we're essentially going to be adding steps that we don't need to do. This is almost already factored for us. So I'm going to factor each of my pieces. I'm just going to start up here in the top left and I just write right over top. Some of these aren't too bad because we have 9 minus y and 9 plus y because this is a difference of squares. On the bottom, I need two numbers that multiply to 54 and add to 15. And so that's y plus 9 and y plus 6. That's not too bad. And I'm going to keep going. I'm going to do the other side too. So I'm going to say I need two numbers that multiply to negative 24 and add to positive 5. So that's going to be y plus 8 and y minus 3. And the last thing I need is I need two numbers that multiply to negative, 30, negative 72 and add to negative 1. And so that's going to be y minus 9 and y plus 8. At this point, we can recognize that we can start canceling stuff out. So I'm going to start by canceling out any of my factors that are identical. In other words, y plus 8 cancels out with y plus 8. Is that the only thing that's identical? Well, y plus 9 and 9 plus y are the same thing because addition's commutative, right? So those are really the same thing. Does that also mean that what we have down here the y minus 9 is the same as 9 minus y. The answer is no. Those are not the same. Why not? Because subtraction is not commutative. 
So what would it be? They can cancel out, but they can only cancel out after we make a little change. I'm going to factor out a negative 1. If I take a negative 1 out of both of these, then what I'd end up with is negative 1. And then I'd have negative y plus 9 or simply 9 minus y if I were to reorder it. Okay, because addition is commutative, so I reordered the addition. All right, so that is to say that 9 minus y and y minus 9 do cancel out, but they don't just cancel out and go away because in the process of canceling out, they produce, they produce a negative 1. So we can cancel them out, but that means our answer has got to have that negative 1. So I'm going to go ahead and just look at what I have left. I have a y minus 3 on top. I have a y plus 6 on bottom. And then lastly, I have a negative 1. I'm just going to put it in front. I'm going to put a negative in front and be done. Divide. Okay, so these are two fractions. And the truth is, I've never divided two fractions before. What I do is I flip and then I multiply. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right here. I'm going to take this second equation, this one right here, and instead of writing it like that, I'm going to flip my problem upside down and write 10r to the fourth over 4 p to the third q squared. Now I'm going to focus on each of my pieces and try to simplify. So I'm going to combine what I have here right now. So combining, I get 120 over 5. So 120 over 5 does simplify. That simplifies to just 24, okay? So if I were to take all my numbers in the problem, then I would end up with the 24. But don't forget, you got to take all the numbers. So 12 times 10 and 5 times 4. So there's actually not a 5 on the bottom. It's actually a 20. All right, so if I were to simplify that, now that I've accounted for all my pro all my numbers, then it does simplify to just 6. Okay. Now we're going to say that's just 6. We could just be a number or it could be in the numerator, right? The other thing we want to do is deal with each of the p's. Okay, so all my p's, I've got one on top and I got three on the bottom. So when I'm done, I'm going to end up with two p's and there was more on the bottom than the top. So that's where they ended up. The Q2s, they both cancel out because they're the same. And so my final answer is 6 over P squared. Dividing. Dividing these rational expressions requires us to do a couple things. One is to recognize that we don't actually divide rational expressions if we can help it. What we do is we flip and multiply. So we flip and then we multiply. The other thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to factor these terms. So I'm going to try to kind of do that all together. So I'm just going to rewrite my first one. My first one, I'm not going to flip. And then my second one, I am going to flip. But I'm going to make sure I multiply when I'm doing this problem. So let's see what that looks like. So the first one, if we were to um, multiply it without flipping it, I'm going to factor it and I get x plus 1 and x plus 3. On the bottom, it's still just x minus 5. I put parentheses around just to show that that couldn't be broken up into pieces. The other one, now we have the x minus 5 on top, okay, because I flipped it. On the bottom, though, I get x minus 6 and x plus 3. Are there any things that cancel out on the top and the bottom? And the answer is most certainly. There's an x minus 5 and an x minus 5 that cancel out. Is there anything else that cancels out? Yeah the x plus 3 and the x plus 3, which means our final answer is x plus 1 over x minus 6. 
we're going to add these two together. Now they already have the same in de same denominator, which is necessary for adding them. So that means we're just going to have x plus nine over, and then we're going to leave it exactly like it was x squared plus 8x minus 9. Now, it doesn't say simplify, but boy, they probably want us to if we can. So the question becomes, x plus 9 is just by itself. We can't actually split that up. But can we take an x plus 9 out of the bottom that will cancel out? So let's try to factor the bottom, and we get x plus 9 and x minus 1. And so we are able to cancel that out. We're able to cancel the x plus 9 on the top and bottom. Now, that would leave us with something on the bottom, but we don't want to forget that when we have something on the bottom, we still have a 1 on the top. We're going to subtract these two fractions. When we subtract fractions, they have to have a common denominator. This already has that. But we need to remember to distribute the negative. Make sure we're distract, subtracting both of them. Okay. So when I do that, my denominator is still going to be x minus 2. But my numerator, we notice we have the x squared minus x squared. So that's going to cancel out. And so we actually end up with positive 3x minus 6. I reordered them. And you're going to notice there's one more thing I can do that jumps out at me is I can take out my greatest common factor. So if I do that, I can actually take this to be 3, and then on the inside, x minus 2. That is that factor. But there's one last step, as you can see, is that the x minus 2s are now on the top and bottom, and they cancel out. So our final answer ends up being just the number 3. Find the LCD, the least common denominator for this list. We don't have to solve them. I just need to find the LCD. Now, when we find the LCD, what that means we're doing is we're trying to find all the factors and make sure all the factors are accounted for in one big denominator. So let's see if we can factor these and find out what they are. So the first one, the first one's not too bad because it looks like they're both going to be negative. And this is one of my favorite ones, 56. I always remember when I was a kid, it was seven times eight. Uh, that was one that like for some reason, it was one that I memorized quicker than the others when I learned my times tables. The other one is smallish numbers, so it's x minus 7 and x plus 1. Okay, so what I want you to notice is we actually have the same number twice, okay? Notice that we have x minus 7 and x minus 7. Then we have x plus 8. And then lastly, we have one last thing. We have x plus 1. So there's actually three different ones. We do not need to repeat the x minus 7 because that's in there in two places. So I'm just going to write all three factors now. We have the x plus 1. We also have x minus 8. And the last thing we're going to need is the x minus 7. So our LCD is going to have all of these pieces. We're going to try to subtract these two, but before we do that, you'll notice that the denominators don't match. That's a real pain because when the denominators don't match, that means we have to get a common denominator. So we're going to try that first. The first thing we need to do is factor. So we have x minus 8 and x minus 1. Our second factor is going to be x minus 8 and x plus 3. Now you notice that there's some repeats there. In other words, hopefully you can see that the x minus 8 is there twice, which means our LCD is going to be that x minus 8, but we also need the x minus 1 and the x plus 3 that are in the other part. So we need all three of those represented in our LCD. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to make that work by putting the x plus 3 that's missing on the top and bottom on the left. And then we're going to put the x plus 1 that's missing 
on the top and bottom on the right. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this whole problem. The denominator, I'm going to put all three of my factors, the ones that we just uh, talked about, the x plus 3, x minus 8, and x minus 1. I'm not going to actually, or x plus 1. I'm not going to do the math and multiply them out. I'm going to leave them factored. But on the top, I'm going to go ahead and combine these. Just remember that we have that negative there. So I'm going to try to make it easier by kind of attaching it to that negative 3. But I'm going to distribute and kind of put this stuff together. So this will give us 5x squared plus 15x minus, let me see if I can do this right, minus 3x minus 9. And then this minus 3x minus 9 has to be multiplied by that x plus 1. I don't want to try to do too many steps at once and make a mistake. So I'm going to kind of in scratch work over here do that last part. Negative 3x minus 9 times x plus 1. So I'm going to try to work that out. And that would give me negative 3x squared minus 9x minus 3x minus 9. And I'm going to combine these two in the middle. Okay. So I think I'm ready to write that as one part right here. We get negative 3x squared minus 12x minus 9. All right, so we've subtracted them. We've made them into one fraction, although it is not the prettiest fraction. We can certainly clean some stuff up. So I'm going to leave the bottom factored, but the numerator, I'm going to try to combine like terms and see what we end up with. On this one, you'll notice that we can combine like terms to get 2x squared plus 3x minus 9. The last question we have is, can we factor that at all so that it could cancel out with one of our three factors that we have on the bottom? Now, I, it's pretty clear to me, and hopefully it's, it's not too scary for me to try to convince you, that x minus 8 is not going to work. And also, <laughs> that x plus 3 will not work. That's my, that's my default guess. I think x plus 1 is going to be the one that works. But let's find out. What we're going to do is we're going to try to factor the numerator and see what we get. So we're looking for two numbers that multiply to 2 and negative 9. So what two numbers do that? 2 and negative 9 is negative 18. The other thing we're looking for is two things that add to 3. Okay, Multiply to negative 18 and add to 3. I actually can come up with two. I think it's going to be 6x minus 3x. Okay. Now, since that's my middle term, I'm just splitting my middle term because I still have the 2x squared in front and I still have the minus 9 at the end. Okay. I say that because don't forget that, that we can't just jump right to our factors there. The next thing we're going to do is we're trying to take out anything that we can. And so if I look at my first two, I can take out a 2x and that would leave me with what, x plus 2. And I can look at my second two and I can take out a negative three and that would leave me with x. Sorry, I'm bad at math here today. x plus three and then I'd end up with an x plus three in this one too. So you'll notice that x plus three is actually taken out twice. And so that's good news because we have an x plus three on the top and the bottom. Okay, so that means we can cancel out the x plus three in our final answer for this problem is 2x minus 3 on the top over x minus 8 times x plus 1. We want to add these two rational expressions together. They have different denominators, so we're going to try to make the denominators the same. And the first one, we're just going to multiply 
by y minus 7 on the top and bottom. And the second one, we're going to multiply by 7y on the top and bottom. When we do that, we're going to get a new fraction with a denominator of y minus 7 times 7y. You don't need to multiply those together. We're just going to leave them just like that. So I'm going to go ahead and distribute and combine and see what we end up with. We get 3y minus 21 plus 56y. I can combine those, so I'm going to do that and combine the y's on the top. And so that would give me 59y minus 21. And the denominator is still just y minus 7 and 7y. Before we close this out and say we're done, we need to check to see if we can factor the numerator at all. Okay, so what can I take out of both of these? Is there anything I take out of both of them? At first glance, part of me says, oh, ooh, what about uh, uh, 7, right? But 7 doesn't go into 59 because 59 is prime. So I'm actually going to be done exactly right here and say this, this mess is just my answer. I've added them. I've, I've simplified the best I can, but nothing else cancels out. simplify this complex fraction, we have a fraction in a fraction with other fractions, okay? So the way we're going to try to make this simple is we're going to try to make it so it's just one fraction when we're done. So we have to combine the two on the top, combine the two on the bottom, and then we'll flip and multiply all together. Combining the two on the top requires us to get a common denominator between a squared and 2a. So that means we need a 2 that we're multiplying on the top and bottom here, and an a that we're multiplying on the top and bottom here. If we do that, what we're going to end up with is 14 minus 1a over 2a squared. On the bottom, we're going to need a common denominator of 3a, so we just need to multiply by 3 on top and bottom, and that would give us a 9 over 3a, plus 7, so that would give us 16 over 3a. Now, this is still divided, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the bottom one and we're going to flip it upside down and we're going to multiply them. Now, before I combine these, I might simplify just a little bit. Okay. In other words, I can notice at this point that I can take an A out of the top and bottom. Beyond that, I don't see anything that jumps out at me. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply. I'm just kidding. I'm going to leave it just like this. Uh, unless it tells you you have to. Let's make our life a little bit easier, and I'm just going to leave it just like that. This is a complex fraction that we're going to simplify down into one fraction. To do that, we're going to try to get all of them to have the same denominator on the top and the same denominator on the bottom. And so x minus 8 is already here, but I'm going to need an x minus 2 if I'm going to combine it with the other one in the numerator. So I have to do that on top and bottom. Same process except in reverse. Here we need an x minus 8 on the top and the bottom. If you look at the bottom, we can go ahead and knock out what our LCD would be on this guy. We have x minus 9 and x minus 8, so we're going to multiply by x minus 9 on the top and bottom here. And we're going to multiply by x minus 8 on the top and bottom here. we still got quite a bit of work to make this nice and pretty, but we can already start to see that it is easier because now we have a single fraction. It's a big one, but it's still single on the top and a single fraction on the bottom.
The truth is, though, what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to take these two fractions after we get the numerators, and we're going to want to flip the second one and multiply. So I'm going to kind of start that right now, just to try to streamline our work a little bit. I'm going to multiply by, and I'm going to flip this second one upside down, because I already know that x minus 9 and x plus 8, or minus 8 goes on the top here, because it was going to go on the bottom. Now, as we work through the rest of it, we just need to remember that we're going to fill in what we have, but first we need to multiply and combine. So that's going to be 15x minus 30 plus x squared minus 8x. So all of that can be combined to just x squared plus 7x minus 30. The bottom one, when we go ahead and multiply the x minus 8 times the 6, we get 6x minus 42 minus 5x plus 45. Watch out. Notice that I had the minus here, and what I did was I just treated it like it was a negative 5 right there. From there, I can go ahead and combine. So I'm going to combine what I have for the 6x minus 5x. That's just an x and the negative 42 and the positive, so plus 3. All right, we can start to see this is much simpler. In fact, it's going to clean up even better in a second. But before we clean it up, we can, can factor one more time. We can factor the numerator on the left. Now that we've combined it, we can see that it's actually x minus 3 and x plus 10. We're finally to my favorite part, which is when I get to cancel things out. Okay, So let's cancel out things that are on the top and the bottom. So x minus 3 and ooh, that's x plus 3. That's no good. I was hoping I could cancel that out, but x plus 3. Um, Let's not cancel that out. But we do have an x minus 8 and an x minus 8. And it looks like we're done. That's the best we can do. So our final answer is all the rest of it. x minus 3, x plus 10, and x minus 9. And in the denominator, we have x minus 2 and x plus 3. Number 55, we're solving for x. And so what we have here is we've got fractions throughout. We have all these fractions, but they don't have the same denominator. If they did have the same denominator, the LCD would be 3x. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to make the LCD 3x for all of them. That means we need an x right here on the top and bottom, and we need a 3 right here on the top and bottom. So that would make that a 27. Okay. Now that they all have the same denominator, we can multiply the whole equation by 3x, and that'll cancel out all the denominators. And now I have an equation, 7x plus 6 equals 8x plus 27, that we can solve much quicker by subtracting the 7x and subtracting the 27, and we get x equals negative 21. Solve for x, we have three things there, but uh, notably, these two have a denominator. They actually have the same denominator. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply everything by that LCD, that least common denominator. Now, that means if I multiply everything by x minus 5, it's still an equation. It still is equal. The catch is when we multiply everything by x minus 5, it cancels out our denominators for these two. So we end up with 4 minus 5, but we have an x minus 5 that we still have to multiply.
simplify, assuming that these are, are non-negative. In other words, we're not talking about uh, getting imaginary or complex numbers here. So to simplify this, we're going to simplify each piece separately. So I'm going to simplify the square root of 20 first. Simplify square root of 20, I need to come up with a perfect square that multiplies into 20 or divides into 20. And so if I think about the factors of 20, are there any numbers that are perfect squares like the number 16 that go into 20? Now, 16 doesn't divide into 20. Neither does 9. But both of those will be perfect squares. One that does divide into 20 is 4. And we like that because the square root of 4 is a number that I know. If we multiplied by the square root of 4, what would we need to multiply by to get the square root of 20? Well, we need square root of 5. 4 times 5 is 20. So the square root of 4 times the square root of 5 is also 20. So our simplified radical is 2 square root 5. Now that's just part 1 because we have another part we're going to deal with. We're going to deal with this a to the 8th. a to the 8th, when we're square rooting it, remember that there's like a little 2 here. And it, in order to do this, all we need to say is how many sets of 2 are there in 8? If I were to take the a's, all 8 of them, and try to pair them up in groups of 2, how many groups would I have? Well, I'd have 4 groups of 2, or in other words, 8 divided by 2 is 4, so I get a to the 4th. Now, the last one we have to talk about is b to the ninth, and then that's still a square root. And you'll notice if we try to group up 9 in groups of 2, there's one left over, okay? We'd end up with four groups of 2 for b's, but there'd be one b that couldn't pair up because there's an odd number. And so what we do is we leave that last b in the square root. The other way to think about this would be it's 9 divided by 2 which is 4.5, or 4 with 1 left over, 1 remainder. Now, to get our answer to look really, really nice, what we're going to do is we're going to put it all back together. So I'm going to put the 2, a to the 4th, and b to the 4th on the outside, and on the inside, I'm going to put 5, b. Simplify. So the square root of 32 doesn't come out nice, but the square root of 16 does. And after all, the square root of 32 is just the square root of 16 times the square root of 2, and the square root of 16 is 4. Now, y to the 7th? 7th isn't going to come out very nicely. In fact, we're going to end up with three pairs with one 7 left over. And then the w also can't pair up with anybody because it's all by itself. So now we're going to combine these two, and we get 4y to the 3rd, square root of 2, y, w. Write the expression in radical form, okay? So what we have in radical form is we take that exponent, but the exponent that has a fraction or the denominator, I put it as the index of a radical. So that's like saying the fifth root of 7 to the fourth. We could also write this as the fifth root of 7 to the fourth. Either one of those would give us the same equivalent value. Simplify the expression. Now, this simplifies by understanding that a one-third power means the cube root of a number. So in other words, what number multiplies by itself three times to give me 343? If you don't know, it actually is 7. 7 times 7 is 49. 49 times 7 is 343. The cube root of 343, if we were to type in our calculator, is 7. Simplify this expression. Now, I want you to notice the way this is written. It is not written with parentheses. In other words, when we're doing this problem, we have to assume that the negative is not a part of this exponent package, or that we're going to essentially have this negative out at the end when we're done. So let's deal with the exponents, but then deal with the negative very end. Okay? So the first thing we're going to notice is that we have a fourth root. I think that's the first thing I notice when I have a fraction exponent. So the fourth root, the fourth uh, exponent to the one fourth is a fourth root. Now, is there a fourth root of 16? Can you think of a fourth root of 16? So something that multiplies by itself four times to get 16? Yeah, I can think of one. Two. Two times two is four times two is eight times two. Yeah, that's just two. Okay? So we could essentially look at this problem as negative on the outside. 
and then two to the negative fifth. So I've dealt with the fact that it was to the to the five fourths by dealing with that fourth root first. The next thing I can do is I notice that there's a negative exponent. Okay, what does negative exponent do? Ne negative exponent flips it upside down. So I still have that negative under on the outside, but what it does is it turns it to one over two to the fifth. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and finish this problem by saying two to the fifth is 16 times 30 times two is 32. So our final answer is negative one over 32. Simplify this expression. Now, just like fractions, I can't add or subtract unless they're common, just like polynomials. So I'm going to see if I can simplify this square root of 80. The square root of 5, I can't simplify. It's ugly. 5 is prime. I can't even factor it. The square root of 80, however, does simplify a little bit. Okay. If we pay attention to the fact that 16 times 5 is 80, 16 times 5 is 80, then what we can say is that 8, the square root of 80, is the square root of 16 times the square root of 5. I also want you to notice that we have a 4 out front, and I don't want you to forget that. So right now we have three numbers multiplied together to give me 4 square root of 80. The 4, the square root of 16, and the square root of 5. I know the square root of 16 is 4, so I'm going to have to do 4 times 4, and I get 16, and I still have that square root of 5. And that seems like it's all I can do. Except we remember that we were doing that problem because we had another square root of 5. Now we can subtract them and we get 15 root 5. Simplify, assuming the variables are non-negative, real numbers. So that means the first thing we're going to do is we can't combine them unless they have something in common. Unless they can be simplified so that the stuff in the radical is the same. So I'm going to try to simplify this as best I can. And I know that this is 16 times 2. 32 is 16 times 2. And I know that the square root of 16 times the square root of 2 would still be the same. The square root of 16 is 4, but let's not forget there was already a 5 out there. So 5 times 4 is 20. So this is going to be 20 square root of 2. And let's not forget there was an x in there the whole time. Well, that's all fun and games. But let me look at this one. Does this one simplify? Well, yes, it does. Because... 18 is 9 times 2, so the square root of 18 is the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. So, in a similar process, we end up leaving the 3 that was already out there, multiplying by 3, and then leaving the square root of 2 that was in there. And we end up with negative 9, square root 2, and then there was also an x there the whole time. Now, this was all fun and games, but it's not over yet because now that they both say square root of 2x, we can go ahead and combine those like terms to get 11 square root 2x. Multiply. Multiply with radicals shouldn't scare you, okay? We do need to distribute just like if we were doing uh, with variables, but... We're going to multiply the insides with the insides and the outsides with the outsides, which means when I multiply it by the first part, I'm not going to multiply it by the 5 and the square root of 15. I'm just going to multiply it by that one cluster. So I have 5 times the square root of 45. And then I end up with plus 7. I don't need to multiply the 7 by anything because it's already part of this chunk. And then 3 times 21 is 63. All right. Now, that would be great. Unless it says simplify. We, we've done it. We've multiplied. But if it says simplify, then we need to go further because it looks like we can simplify these by saying that 5 times the square root of 45 is like 5 times the square root of 9 times the square root of 5. And this is 7 times the square root of 9 times the square root of 7. And so we could simplify this a little bit more by saying 15 square root 5 plus 21 square root 7 so pay attention to the answers. If it does say simplify your answer, then we'd have to go all the way down here. Notice that we still weren't able to add them together because what was in the square root, even when we were done, still did not match. Multiply. Now these aren't too bad, but we're going to have to multiply just like we do with binomials and binomials with variables. We're going to have to FOIL them. So first it's 6 times 6 is 36, and then 5 times 6 is 30, and we just leave the square root of 2 in there, okay? And then we have 
uh, 6 times square root of 2, so that's plus 6 square root of 2. And then lastly, we go 5 times the square root of 2 times square root of 2, which is the square root of 4. Now, as we start to think about how we can combine these, we end up with 36 plus 36 root 2. Those can't combine because just because they have 36 matched, the square root of 2 didn't. And then you'll notice 5 square root of 2. Isn't that the same as 5 times 2, or 10? So our final answer ends up being 46 plus 36 square root 2. Divide. Now, this is a square root over a fraction. And so the nice thing about a square root over a fraction is you can deal with it separately. In other words, I can say that this is the same as the square root of a to the ninth, b to the twelfth, which if we were to try to take out all the pairs we can, what we'd end up with is a to the fourth and b to the sixth, and there's one a that didn't match up, and that would be that. We could square root the bottom, and the square root of 49ab to the sixth isn't too bad because the seven comes out, and three b's come out as well but there's one A left over. So this looks great and everything, but we can actually go further because we can simplify anything out that cancels on the top and bottom. So do you see anything that cancels? Because I certainly do. The A doesn't cancel, but the square root of A is on the top and bottom. And B to the third cancels out with some of the Bs on the top. So our final answer ends up being A to the fourth, B to the third, over 7. Simplify by rationalizing the denominator. Well, you have to understand rationalizing the denominator is just because we're not just supposed to make it simpler necessarily. What we're supposed to do is make it so it doesn't violate any rules. One of our rules is that you cannot have a square root in the denominator of a fraction. So we need to get rid of that. One way we can do that is just simply multiply by itself. To multiply by that, what you'll notice happens is it cancels out because anything multiplied by itself, if it's both square rooted, we end up with 2x to the ninth, which is nice. That, I mean, it's better because it doesn't have a square root, and that's what we want it. But the problem is we need to do it at the top and the bottom. And on the top, we do have a square root when we're done. I'm going to simplify a little bit and take out... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can take out some of those x to the nines, okay? And so when we take out some of those x to the nines, we can take out four pairs of them, right? And leave one in. And we already have one out there. So it's x to the fifth, square root of 2x, all over 2x to the ninth. At this point, you'll notice that we look like we don't have a square root in the bottom, but you will probably already notice that we can also still cancel some stuff out. There's x's on the top and the bottom. And so we're gonna rewrite this as square root of 2x over 2 and there was a, it wasn't an even match so i still have x to the fourth on the bottom simplify by rationalizing the denominator now the first thing to recognize here is that when we have a radical and a fraction we can split them up into pieces in other words i'm going to cube root the top and cube root the bottom And so cube rooting the top isn't too bad because that, that's just one. But cube rooting the bottom did not go away. Now, if we're going to cancel out a square root, we just multiply by itself because a square root times a square root is, well, itself. But that's not true for a cube root. It's not true for a cube root because a cube root times a cube root isn't necessarily itself because they're not supposed to make pairs. They're supposed to make two pairs, okay? So in order to make this work, what we need to multiply by is itself twice, okay? So we're going to square both of these. That's what we're going to do. In other words, do it twice. When we do that, it ends up canceling everything else pretty nicely there on the bottom. So I'm going to write it down here. It ends up being 29x, okay? Because the they were all to the third power but on the top I have I do have a mess I have the cube root of 
29 squared x squared. So now it is rationalized. It doesn't look beautiful, but it doesn't have a square root in the denominator, which is really all we cared about. Simplify by rationalizing the denominator. There's square roots. We can't have square roots in the denominator, so we're going to multiply by the converse. Okay, or sorry, the conjugate, which means if we multiply by 22 plus the square root of 13, well, guess what would happen? It would actually not get rid of square roots. I'd still have them. It would get rid of some, but it would create more. But if we multiply by the conjugate, then what we get is something pretty nice because it cancels out the middle terms. It's like having a difference of squares, okay? So the bottom ends up being 22 minus 13 or just 9. The top is not so pretty, okay? It's not going to cancel out just, just quite the same. So what we are going to be able to do is do a little bit of math. I'm going to foil these out. And the square root of 22 times square root of 22 would be 22. The square root of 13 times the square root of 13, well, that, that would be 13. The negatives are going to cancel out to make it positive. But then I'm going to end up with twice. So I'm going to end up with negative 2 square root of 13 times 22. Okay, so I'm just going to write 13 times 22 in here because I don't want to multiply it. Now, I can clean this up just a little bit. So on the top, I end up with 41 minus 2 times the square root of 220 to 66. So 286 all over uh, da, 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 all over just 9. So now when I look at it, I... I'm tempted to try and simplify more, but the truth is it's not going to work for me. For one, 49 is prime, but also that square root doesn't have any perfect squares in it. Solve this radical equation. So the first thing we're going to do is get the radical by itself by adding 9 to both sides. That gives me the square root of x equals 12. Now I'm going to square both sides to get rid of my square root and I get x equals 144 okay so now if I go back if I plug in 144 does it work 144 the square root would be 12 minus not yep it works so I'm gonna go with it solve this the radical is already by itself so I'm gonna square both sides and I would get 10 x minus 16 equals x squared now I've got a quadratic, so I'm going to solve it by factoring, by getting it all equal to zero. So I'm going to leave the x squared over there and bring over everything else. x squared minus 10x plus 16. So the two numbers that jump out to me are x minus 8 and x minus 2 equals zero. And again, when I solve by factoring, that means I know that my true answers are x equals 8 and x equals 2. I do want to go back and check to see if they both work and if I plug them both in they both still give me the right answer. Simplify using i notation as needed. So in this case that negative under a square root would normally make us go oh there's not a real answer but there isn't a real answer but that doesn't mean there's not an answer. The answer just isn't real, and that's what we call it when we have imaginary numbers. We say it's not real, so we call it imaginary. So that is to say this negative can be taken out of the square root. And when we take it out, we don't put a negative on the outside. We put an I on the outside. Underneath, it's still 175, so we're going to deal with that like we normally would, and we're going to say, what's a nice perfect square that goes into this? Well, what about 25 goes into 175? 25 and 7. So the square root of 25 and the square root of 7. And so we're going to end up with 5i square root 7. Add or subtract. These are complex numbers, so there's a real part and imaginary part. The real part we're going to add. So 5 and 4 thirds. And so I'm going to make this 5 is going to become 15 thirds. So I can add them. Now they have common denominators. 15 plus 4 is 19 so 19 thirds is my real part if i take a look at my imaginary parts 
I have a positive 3i and a negative 8i. So that's not too much math. I'm just going to say it's, well, it's negative 5i. I'm going to treat it almost like a variable. And so my complex number, we also like to put the real part first. Multiply. So this one, we're going to multiply, which means we're going to FOIL it out. So first thing we're going to see is we're going to have 21i squared plus 35 I, and then we have on the bottom, we end up multiplying the second piece and we get negative six I and negative 10. So we can combine a few things, but before we combine a few things, I want you to notice that we have a 21 I squared. I squared is equal to negative one. So that's like writing 21 times a negative one. The other ones we can go ahead and combine and we get 29i and minus 10. But at this point, we can actually take it one step further and put all the real parts together. And we get negative 31 plus 29i. This one says divide, okay? So, but what we really have here is we've got a fraction, which is a type of division. When we have this complex number in the denominator and that's against the rules actually our answers can never have complex numbers in the denominator even when we accept that they can be real they're still not allowed in the denominator that's like saying zero is a real number but we still can't divide by zero so in order to get rid of this in the denominator we're going to multiply by the conjugate three minus nine i the same numbers just we have a switch sign we have to do that on top and bottom because math says we have to be fair and do things to be equal so the next thing we're going to do is when we foil this all out this is actually going to end up being 90 on the bottom okay in other words there's no eyes they end up canceling out on the top what we end up getting is 81 and then minus 63 i the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to figure out if we can simplify this at all now usually when we put our answers in and we're dealing with complex numbers we're going to want it in a plus bi format in other words we split the this up into a real part and an imaginary part and it looks like these will simplify down a little bit okay so we'll end up with 9 over 10 minus 7 over 10 i now why do we have to simplify at the end it feels like a lot of times we don't the reason we had to simplify at the end is we actually could have canceled out a three from the very beginning okay and so since we didn't do that, we eventually had to simplify that at the end. Use the square root property to solve this equation. Square root property says if you got something squared and you want to solve that equation, you could just square root both sides. But it's a little bit more complicated because when we just square root both sides, it cancels out the square. And we get z plus 5, but the other side becomes plus or minus the square root of the result. So... Now, if we wanted to solve it, we need to subtract five. And so we end up with two answers. Z equals five, negative five, plus or minus the square root of five. Solving by completing the square, I really like, because it says this is something I can't factor. So let's say we can't factor it. Now this is gonna be, it looks like five and two, so I probably would just factor it. But let's imagine we can't factor it. And we say X squared, plus 10x plus something would be a perfect square and we say 7 isn't a perfect square 7 is not a square at all so what we can do is we subtract 7 from both sides so now it's a negative 7 over here and we've opened up this perfect blank space and i know that since 10 is in the middle half of 10 is 5 and 5 squared is 25 so i know that if i put a 25 there it would make this problem nice and pretty because I'd be able to factor it to just x plus 5 squared. The problem is I can't just put a 25 there because I want to unless I also put a 25 on the other side. And then I can do that because that's what algebra says. 
from here we can now square root both sides and if I do that I get x plus 5 equals plus or minus the square root of 18. So as we look at this we go oh now I need to subtract 5 from both sides and I get negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 18. If you want you could try to simplify that a little bit further if you need to simplify your answer just remember to watch out for things like that square root of 18 is really the square root of 9 times the square root of 2 or 3 square root 2. So depending on the way it asks for your answer when you're doing a problem on a quiz or a test just pay attention if you need to simplify then do that. 78 solve the following equation using the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now that's something I've memorized if you don't that's okay but how we do that is the first thing we have to do is we get it equal to 0. And then we label our a, b, and c. a is our first coefficient of 1, b is negative 12, and c is 49. Then we're going to plug it into our formula. And what we get is negative b, so that's positive 12, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so that's 144, minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. Okay. Now it becomes just a matter of making sure we're typing in the calculator correctly and doing our cal calculations carefully. Okay. But if we do, what are we going to end up with? Well, we're going to end up with kind of an ugly, ugly answer. So let's walk through it. I'm going to do it by hand just for funsies which means on the bottom I have a 2 still. Uh, I have a 12 here, but the meat of my problem is trying to simplify that square root. So 4 times 1 times 49, what does that equal? That equals 146. Okay, so I need to subtract, sorry, let me do that right, 196. Um, check my math there. And so if we're going to subtract that, we end up getting plus or minus the square root of actually a negative number. Okay. And so if I go negative and that would give me 52. So I could either keep going and deal with the fact that we have an imaginary number, but also I want you to recognize after we simplify that, pay attention to whether or not your answer allows you to give imaginary numbers or complex numbers because since this has a negative in the square root then there is no real solution so if that's an option then you can save yourself some time and just check the inside of that to find the answer or should find whether there is an answer Solve the following equation using the quadratic formula this one's a little bit nicer so we should be able to do this we have a equals 1 b equals negative 5 and c equals 3. So our formula is negative b, so that's 5, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so that's 25, minus 4 times a times c all over 2a. This one, if you notice the discriminant there in the inside, what we end up with is 25 minus 12, so we get 5 plus or minus the square root of 13 over 2. This one says, hey, don't do all the work, please. It just says, find the discriminant. So what we're going to do is first get it equal to 0. 4z squared plus 4z plus 5 equals 0. And so a equals 4, b equals 4, and c equals 5. So we're going to try this in just the discriminant, which was the part in the square root. So that's b squared, so 16, minus 4 times a, which is also 4, times c, which is 5. And if we were to multiply that out, all out, what we'd end up is a 
negative number in here. So what we'd say is we have two non-real solutions. They exist, they just don't really exist. They're imaginary. Find all real and complex roots, okay? This one scares people. Why does it scare people? Well, because it's got an X to the fourth. But the nice thing is we have a formula for find X. It's the quadratic formula. But instead, we're just going to treat this problem like it had, like it just was X squared. So I'm just going to kind of make a note that X really is X squared, okay? And if we wanted to be like Koi, so make sure we didn't forget, I'm going to say that Y equals X squared. So I'm going to rewrite this as y squared minus 2y minus 24 equals 0. If we're trying to find all the complex roots, then I'm going to start right here and say, can I solve this? And yeah, this looks like it's factorable. At y minus 6 and y plus 4. And so I already have two answers. I've got y equals 6 and y equals negative 4. Although, remember, y represented x squared. So now I'm going to rewrite my equations as x squared equals 6 and x squared equals negative 4. Now, if I use my square root property to get this, I'm going to say x equals plus or minus the square root of 6 or x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 4. Now I can simplify that to be x equals plus or minus 2i. So I have two real roots. They're irrational, but they're real. And two imaginary roots or complex roots. Graph the quadratic equation. This isn't too bad if you know your parent functions. Your parent functions are the basic functions. So the parent function for this one is y equals x squared. And I know that's a parabola. A parabola is a U shape and it looks like this. Until you start changing it, this is what it looks like. So there we have it. But this is x squared minus four. So all we have to do is subtract four. In other words, we're gonna move this down, move this down four. and graph it. And guess what? That's my answer. This one says find the domain and range of the relation and then say whether it relation is a function. So first we're going to say domain. The domain is all of the x values. Now when we're writing out the domain, we list them and we put curly braces, but also we don't repeat. So if I ever see one that's the same number twice, like this one, I'm not going to repeat it. Okay, so my domain is just those three numbers because two of the numbers were the same. My range is all my y values. And again, we're going to use curly bracket and I'm going to write my values, but if it repeats, I do not repeat it. So I have my domain and range, but the second part says what is whether it's a relation or a function. Is, is this relation a function? And the rule for whether it's a function is functions are not, I should say, it's not a function if repeat x's give different y's. So let's take a look at our repeat x's. Now I'm not looking at my repeat y's, I'm looking at my repeat x's. So we said that 5 eighths was here twice. When you look at 5 eighths, the first time 5 eighths was paired up with a 3. So if it was a function, every time I see 5 eighths, it should be paired up with a 3. But this time, it was paired up with a negative 6. So this is not a function. Determine whether this relation is a function. Now, first off, this is a constant function. This is a function. And if you were to graph it, what you get is y equals 4 is a horizontal line. 
And when we graph it, we can think it and say, does it pass the vertical line test? And so, yes, this is a function. Determine whether this is a function, okay? If you would try to solve it for a y equals, okay? That's, that's kind of the way we determine when we have an equation whether it's a function. If it can be y equals, then it's a function. So the first thing we're going to do to try to get y equals, just y equals, is we're going to try to sub divide by 2. And so I now have y squared equals x over 2. And then we still got the y not by itself. So if I square root both sides, remember that the square root means that we have a plus or minus. And so this is our giveaway for whether something is or is not a function. If I get a y equals and there's more than one answer on the other side so if i have a plus or minus then i have a problem okay so y equals if there's a plus or minus then it is not a function for each of these find the following and now do not think this is f times x that f x notation is to just say hey we've got a function of x and what i want you to do is plug everywhere you see an x I want you to plug a zero. And so for that, what we'd say is f of zero, and we plug it in, and what we get is zero. So f of zero, zero. If we plugged in negative five, well, what would we get? Well, we get 115. And if we plugged in f of five, we get 130. Five. Those would be our answers. For the function, find a f of a minus 3. So don't just plug in a, don't just plug in negative 3. Plug in where this is an x, plug in a minus 3. And so f of a minus 3 equals 4 times a minus 3 minus 7. We're going to distribute a little bit and get 4a minus 12 minus 7 equals 4a minus 19. Find this very bizarre thing for this function. Okay, so according to this, we need three things. First, we need an f of x plus h. So I'm going to just start there. We have an f of x, and I need an f of x plus h. And so that means we're going to replace the x with an x plus h in our function. And I have to do that everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put an x plus h. Then we're going to go ahead and distribute. Don't just distribute that exponent, but rather FOIL out in this first one. And if we do that, the first one's going to become x squared. And then it's going to be plus 2 x h plus h squared and the last part is minus 5 x minus 5 h and from here we should be able to clean this up a little bit and say f of x plus h i'm just combining like terms here f of x plus h is x squared well i'm not even going to clean it up it's it's ugly let's just let's just leave it what it is it's ugly I could try to reorder it, but there is no like terms to combine, okay? So that's the point I'm trying to make here. The next thing it says is after we find the f of x plus h, it says go ahead and subtract f of x from that. Okay, that seems weird, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and do that, and I'm going to line it up, okay? So f of x is x squared, so I'm going to take the x squared and put it there, and the minus 5x, so I'm going to put minus 5x. And since we're subtracting, I'm going to switch the signs. All right, so if we go ahead and subtract those, like it says, what we get is 2xh plus h squared minus 5h. Which brings us to the last step. The last step, and it says down at the bottom, divide the whole thing by h. So we're going to do that. I'm going to divide the whole thing by h. 
Another way to say that is to divide each H out. And so what I'd end up with if I did that is an H that cancels out of each term. And so I have 2X minus 5 plus H. And that's my final answer. It doesn't feel like it's it's finished, but that just know that what we're building on here, what they're asking here is something that's useful in things like calculus. And so we've just kind of mentioned it, but we didn't really give you a reason for why we we're finding this very specific thing. Let's talk about domain. Finding the domain of a rational function comes down to figuring out what would break it. And what would break this is if the denominator were zero. So I just want to find out what numbers would make this zero. Now, one effective way to do that would be to factor it, because when we set a quadratic equal to zero, we factor it. And so this one is x plus one and x plus eight. So when does it equal zero? Well, it equals zero when x equals negative one and x equals negative eight. So my domain is all real numbers not equal to negative one or negative eight. If I needed to write that in interval notation, I would say, hey, you can start all the way at negative infinity and go all the way to negative eight, but then I need you to skip negative eight and then pick up on the other side of negative eight. So at negative eight, uh, you know, just a little bit past it and go all the way until you get to negative one and then skip to the other side of negative one and then go all the way to infinity. Find the domain of this radical function now, radicals, if they're even powered or even index, then they can't be a negative. So in other words, what we're saying is what's in there, the 3p minus 2 has to be greater than or equal to 0. So we're going to try to solve that and figure out what the answer is. So the domain should be the answer to that inequality. So we're going to add 2 to both sides and then divide by 3. And we get p is greater than or equal to two thirds. And so that is my domain. My domain is that problem right there. If I need it in interval notation, I'd say from two comma three inclusive all the way to positive infinity.